Hi everyone, welcome to What's the Story with Narrative Game Development. My name is John Manning and I'm a co-founder of Secret Lab where we work on the Yarn Spinner narrative tool as well as recently Night in the Woods. This was originally going to be a panel where we were going to gather a bunch of fantastic brains of narrative developers and the people that they carry as well and have a chat about workflow and tools. And sadly, we can't be with you this year. We wish that we were there, but uh, alas. So we did something that we think that you'll like quite a bit. We gathered some of the best people that we know in writing and in narrative development and we sat down and had a chat about their workflows, the way that they select their tools, what they think is a good tool and more. So to start us off, let's hear from Tim Nugent about the overall situation of narrative tools. Hi, uh, so welcome to Narrative Tooling Trends. Uh, I'm Tim, hello. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person because COVID, yay. Uh, I am a uh, independent game developer and I'm also a lead dev on Yarn Spinner Narrative uh, Framework. So I live in Hobart. It's actually not too far away from where the conference is. Assuming COVID ever lets us travel again, you should definitely come down and visit. It's very, very lovely. It's actually kind of similar to Wellington in my opinion. It's a little bit smaller but it has better coffee, so it's sort of like, you know, it, it's an acceptable trade-off. So what is this talk about? Uh, so this talk is going to be a really very brief sort of uh, chat about narrative tooling and trends in narrative games. Uh, now it's going to be focused primarily on the indie space uh, and smaller teams because that is what I see and know. I'm sorry, I have no idea what AAA devs are doing in narrative. Apologies. So why am I specifically doing this? Uh, so this is actually a thing I do roughly once a year. I don't always, in fact, I've never presented a talk on it before, but it's something I do as a dev on Yarn Spinner because I feel it's really important to know what's out there because if you don't know what your competition slash friends are doing, you're not going to be able to be inspired slash steal their ideas. Um, so I will occasionally merge 2020 and 2021 together at times when I'm talking about things. That's because last year and this year have sort of merged together in my mind, so apologies if I stuff the dates up with different things. Now the biggest caveat here, other than the fact that I work on Yarn Spinner, so obviously I, I like it, uh, is that I'm a programmer and I'm a terrible writer, like just abysmal. So my insights are therefore naturally twisted towards the programmer angle, but I think that's really important. I think you want programmers interested in narrative tools because you want us exploring and working on it so that way you as writers can work on the thing you actually enjoy and you can leave the building of the tools up to us. Or at least that's the, you know, the, the dream, the perfect version. So uh, let's get started with some sort of trends in games themselves. Now with, as with all trends, these actually started a while ago and we're just sort of feeling the, uh, the repercussions of them hitting us now. And the main trend as far as I uh, am seeing it in this space is it's definitely more show than tell. Uh, which is sort of like a bit of a cop-out because there's always been this inevitable push towards emergent narrative and environmental storytelling. But I do think it is a little bit different nowadays. In particular, I think we're seeing a lot more sort of being in the moment storytelling in games. I would say this is personified, it's not a person, exemplified by Umarangi Generation uh, winning both Best Narrative and the Seamus McNally, was that just last week? Two weeks ago? Very recently. Congratulations to them, the well-deserved. But I also think there's two better examples in my opinion, and that is Fortnite and Blaseball. And I know those two sound very different from each other, but Fortnite's live events and just the entirety of Blaseball is less about the thing that is actually happening and more about being there and the stories you as the community when you're part of it tell yourselves. So I think these all sort of tie together into this trend of, you know, less tell, more show and more being in the moment. And again, these are ripples that are hitting us now from a while ago. As part of one of those ripples, I'm seeing a lot more interest in storylets as a uh, thing people are asking about, people are talking about a little bit more. I don't think storylets are the driver of this change. Uh, I think they may be a reaction to these sort of changes in narrative. Uh, but I think people are naturally wanting to break their stories more up into little pieces that can be strung together. Now, if you're not sure what a storylet is, uh, the very brief sort of description is instead of having a, a large flowing or branching story, uh, you have it cut up into lots of little chunks that then get assembled together on the fly by the game. The way they get assembled and how they get presented is sort of uh, on a game by game basis, so I can't really speak too much about that. 
But the idea is your story gets broken up and then gets reassembled based on what happens in the game itself. And these can be done on sort of like the high level passage or node by node basis or even on a line by line basis, depending on what you need. Now, you might be wondering, why would I care if you're sort of new to these? I mean, the main advantage is you get a much more dynamic feeling story, but you do need to do a little bit more work up front to define these predicates that let the stories uh, flow together. So, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. Um, this isn't a talk about Storylets, so if you're interested, please go see M Short's blog post about it uh, called Storylets You Want Them. It's by far the best introduction into them you will find. It's from two years ago, it's very, very good. Actually, everything she writes is good, so just read her entire blog. Uh, on to tooling and uh, a little bit away from games and story themselves, let's talk about that. So the single largest trend across all narrative tools I have seen, regardless of the space actually, is localization and internationalization. I'm just going to say localization here, I do know they're different. Uh, and I'm seeing this being brought more and more to the forefront. Even just a couple of years ago, it was sort of a, uh, a thing that people would mention and then maybe work on, whereas now it's being presented more and more as a necessary component of their stories. And I think that's really, really excellent. There's no disadvantage here. The other sort of trend I'm noticing is I think we're actually seeing more of a split in the tooling of whether you write it all as text or whether you write it all as nodes slash passages. Now this has always been a thing, go back to any point in, in games writing and you'll find this sort of dichotomy. Um, it still seems even tools which are custom built and aren't realistically either of these still tend to talk about themselves as if they're one of these. So I'm actually seeing this as being more pronounced than ever before. And I'm not entirely sure why that is, but it is very interesting that it's happening. And of course, I'm seeing a lot more uh, discourse around spreadsheets. People are both getting more frustrated with spreadsheets, but also falling back on spreadsheets. So, yay, spreadsheets, woo! Uh, and I think this is all sort of a side effect, at least from where I'm sitting, what I'm seeing is of a settling down of the tooling around narrative. So if you go back five to seven years ago, there was a really big explosion of what are 100% narrative focused games. So I'm talking like 80 days, uh, Firewatch, so on and so forth. Uh, and that, that effect sort of flowed inwards down. And you're we seeing people were making these games and then as part of it, people were either going, oh, I really want to make a game like that and then building tooling to support it. All those games themselves were releasing uh, said tooling that they built. And this is not to say that people are no longer making narrative games. This is not to say that people are no longer making tooling for narrative games. I'm just seeing there's less of a push around it now. People are settling down and using the tools that were already built uh, or making their own and just not making a big song and dance out of it anymore. Unless, of course, you're working in Unreal. Uh, Unreal is very interesting in the narrative space right now in that it just has less options. Uh, there was a tweet by Lucy Morris, which I saw signal boosted by um, Chris Murphy earlier in this year, basically going like, hey, what are my options? And they were pretty bare. Um, if you look at the web, you've got every single tool under the sun can talk to the web some way if you're making a web game. If you're using Unity, you've got, you know, Fungus, Ink, Yarn, Pixel, Crushes, Dialogue System, you've got Odyssey Draft, so on and so forth. If you go to Unreal, there's pretty much just Odyssey, uh, and that's about it. Um, I did a real quick uh, check on the Unreal Marketplace and the Unity Asset Store. I just typed dialogue system into the search bar and they both uh, have a very highly rated top of the line thing called dialogue system or dialogue plugin, depending on which one you use. They're both very highly rated, but there's just an entire order of magnitude difference in the number of people using the Unity one. There's also just an entire order of magnitude difference in the number of options in the Unity one. Now I'm not saying the Unreal one's bad, I'm saying the Unity one's good. In fact, I've not used the Unreal one, so I don't know if it's any good. I presume it is, it's got five stars. Um, but there's just less variety, there is less options. And that tends to boil down to, I'm seeing every Unreal dev I know who's working on a narrative game is generally so far writing their own. Uh, they're building a bespoke tool. They tend to use Unreal's uh, actually quite excellent graph editor uh, custom tooling to, to build up a, a node-based sort of flow. but you know, that's not the only option, it's just that seems to be what you do if you're working on narrative in Unreal. And that's fine, I just think it's a bit of a big ask for a small team to always be building custom tooling. So, you know, there's definitely a space for more stuff in Unreal. So, uh, some other interesting little things that aren't really worthy of being a trend as such. Um, 
What are some cool things that are happening in narrative tools? I think personally my favorite one is Twine recently got Storylet support, or technically I guess Harlow got Storylet support. So you can now create sort of these yarn passages as Storylets and chain them together. Uh, Ink actually got V1 released, uh, which is awesome. They also at the same time got a uh, Epic Mega Grant, which is great. Uh, so maybe Ink for Unreal, I don't know. Um, they also, if you haven't read it, read their Patreon post about making a blackjack playing AI in Ink. It was really, really interesting. Uh, Yarn Spinner has been teasing enums, which is cool. Uh, this is a small one, but I really like this. Fungus uh, has announced UPM support. Uh, it's on their roadmap, which I'm like, yes, because I like UPM as much as I complain about it. Um, the other really interesting thing uh, we're starting to see more of, and I think this is again a side effect of that, that uh, Athel mentioned settling down, is we're starting to see some more advanced integration of the tools into the engine. Uh, now both these examples are for uh, Unity. Uh, one is by Wayward Strand, they're using Ink, and the other is by uh, Laszlo Bon. I apologize, I don't know your actual name. Uh, but in both cases, they're the same thing. They read through the, uh, the narrative script, so Ink in Wayward's uh, case, Yarn in Laszlo's case, and then it generates a Unity timeline, so the animation timeline thing in Unity, which then lets you modify and tweak it directly. And I just, I really, really love that. I thought it was such a great idea, something that I would never even think to do, and people are already out there doing it. I think it's really, really cool. So the other side of trends is, you know, we've been hit by the trend, now it's got to continue off on its own way. So where's it heading off? So where do we think we will be seeing these things heading? So this is complete supposition on my bit, unlike the rest, which are actually based on seeing things. Uh, the first thing I think we're going to start seeing more of, uh, whether it be officially supported or through third parties, people making things, is we're going to see better coupling of the engine and the narrative tool. In particular, uh, the best example is um, what Wayward Strand uh, has been doing with Ink and creating custom timelines. That uh, is definitely sort of a V1 of what could be something truly amazing if it ever gets either official ink support or some sort of you know, release in some way. Things like that is what we're going to start seeing more of because the tools are settling down, which means the desire for more functionality of these things you're now learning is gonna increase. Uh, so I think we're gonna see sort of less custom UI, more it just works out of the box stuff. I think we're gonna start seeing more better environmental coupling and this is a term I've been trying to work out the best name for, and every time I bring it up, I have to explain it because I can't work out the best term. If you do have a, a better name, shout out. Oh, wait, you're not here. Sorry, I have to make that joke. It's required. Um, so uh, in that our narrative uh, writing or creation, whether it be written text or like a node thing, still actually tends to be sort of heavily isolated from the environment it then gets placed in. Uh, so even if you're using a tool like Fungus where you sort of build a world out from the narrative, the narrative sort of pushes its way out into the world, or whether you build a world and the narrative is then placed into it, in the case of something like uh, um, Yarn, uh, there's sort of still this disconnect between the two. So I would think there was definitely a space for people to explore this a little bit better in that it would be really cool if changes in the environment were automatically reflected into the, nar uh, the narrative, and also the other way around, if the narrative could push changes off into the environment itself and change the world that it's expected to be running in. Not entirely sure how this would work at this stage, I just think it's something that people will want to start seeing. Uh, maybe we'll have some sort of declarative language of world building, as in like physical space building, uh, some sort of like SQL for physicality, uh, who knows. Uh, and then the next thing I'm already starting to see some small movements towards as people are working on this is better narrative structure coupling. So by this I mean, are you doing a gauntlet? Are you doing a time cave? Are you doing a branch and bottleneck? You know, you've got a defined structure as to how you want your story to work regardless of how it's going to work. Why can't the tools help you with that? So currently they just let you go at it, you build whatever you want. And I'm not saying you want, you know, you don't want to be writing and the tool goes like, ah, you've made six branches, that's too many, time to stop. Um, but you do want, you do want a little bit more feedback, as in like, hey, you, you asked me to help you build this, and you're building something that looks nothing like it, is that actually what you want? Uh, things like that, something so the narrative tooling itself is more aware of your end goal, as to what that will actually be, I don't know. And then, 
The final sort of potential trend is one that I actually considered mentioning at the start because it is something that we're seeing more of already uh, and that is AI, natural language processing, etc. Um, I didn't mention this one in the trends because currently I think it's more of a toy. Uh, it's not ready yet. Maybe it will be uh, soonish, I don't know. I do think a lot of it is more a side effect of the fact that things like uh, GPT, what are we up to, 3 now I think, um, are more commonly available than they were even just a few years ago, which means you can build these sort of like, hey, I'm writing a story and then it you know, ch -ch 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 chunks it all out for you. I don't think they're ready yet. I think it is something that you do need to at least start having a look at and being like, maybe this could be useful. It's definitely not yet though, in my opinion. So I, uh, I promised the other speakers on the panel that I wouldn't go for too long. So hopefully I haven't gone for too long. Uh, that's pretty much everything I wanted to say. If you have any sort of feedback or comments, just tweet at me uh, or you know throw a rock really hard. Um, that would be a hell of a throw. Um, so thank you, bye. Thanks, Tim. So earlier this week, I sat down with seven experts in narrative and I asked them, how do you work and why? Hi everyone, I'm Ryan North. I'm the author of a couple interactive books like To Be or Not To Be and Romeo and or Juliet. And I've also written uh, fiction, nonfiction, comics, and uh, a bunch of games too. Uh, the most recent one coming out soon is uh, Lost in Random for Zoink, which is very exciting. I'm Samara Jade Sendek. Uh, I'm a freelance narrative designer, uh, ex-MMA fighter, and uh, local menace to Naram in Australia. I'm John Engold. I'm the narrative director of Inkle. We're a pretty tiny independent game studio from the UK that specializes in narrative games. Uh, we're probably best known still for 80 Days, even though that's a game we made about seven years ago now, but we also did Heaven's Vault and recently uh, a reverse murder mystery called Overboard. I'm Seth. I'm a narrative designer at Mighty Kingdom. I am a podcaster and editor and I write. Uh, I've written one novel, technically. I'm Cecile Richard. Uh, I'm a graphic designer, zine maker, and game designer. Uh, my name's Scott Benson. I'm a, one of the directors of Night in the Woods and one of the writers of that game, and like also artist, animator. Love, I did a lot of stuff on that one. Um, and then now I'm uh, one of the co-founders and creative director at uh, the Glorious Society. I'm uh, Paris Butler Leveson. I am the co-founder of the longest running game development studio in Tasmania, Australia, Secret Lab. Uh, we are best known for our work on Night in the Woods and also building the narrative game tool Yarn Spinner. Uh, hi, I'm Kat Manning. I'm a narrative designer and writer. Uh, my career has spanned everywhere from making games on my own to working on indie products. And now I am at Riot, where I do uh, work on League of Legends and also work on some unannounced R&D products. Game Dev is basically a team building exercise stretched into a marathon. Uh, and I like one of my best workflows, uh, the best ways to uh, engage with my workflow is to just um, you know, uh, lock me in a room and uh, I will emerge um, between two days to two months later with um, what I feel is the best direction. For a writer, one of the most important things to know is what you need to do good work. And for me, I know I do my best writing in the morning after about 2, 3 p.m. I'm rarely any good. I certainly don't do good work in the evening. And so when I go to write, I'll, I'll schedule my day so I do my writing in the morning so I can feel accomplished and know that I've, I've done what I need to do and set myself up to succeed. I also learned that I work best writing alone. Um, usually I'm writing comedy and there are some writers who can work in coffee shops and I cannot because the only way I know to write comedy is to try to make myself laugh and it is super embarrassing to be that guy in the coffee shop sort of typing and going, ho, 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 good, good joke, me, I love this. So when we founded the company back in 2011, our intention was actually not to make games at all, but to work in publishing with writers doing kind of interactive things for iPhones and iPads uh, and that sort of thing. And so we knew we wanted to make things that were built around the idea of interactive fiction. That's my background in game design anyway. I get lost really easily in long things of text, um, but if I can write a conversation and I can break it up graphically, 
and arrange it graphically, like that just makes sense. Um, makes a lot more sense to me at least. Um, and it also creates a lot less room for me to make lots and lots and lots of mistakes that someone else has to correct later. Because of all the all the games that I make are fairly linear and um, straightforward in, in their narrative. Um, I don't really have to think about like branching narratives and stuff like that. So um, I tend to essentially write a script kind of like you would write a script for like, like, I don't know, TV show, film, uh, whatever, something that, you know, just kind of flows in that sense. So when I was starting uh, in 2013, the kind of uh, the the kind of understood first step if you wanted to make a video game, you did not know how to make video games. Go to Twine. You know, um, I'd played a lot of Twine games. Thought they were very cool. Twine's amazing. Twine kind of serves the same market as Yarn Spinner does. So we see a lot of people making Twine games or Yarn Spinner games that don't traditionally fit into the game development world, but uh, these tools are bringing them into game development, which is just amazing. And Twine was like pretty user friendly, uh, famously, and it's just boxes and strings, and I could picture it. Because it was like how I pictured choose your own adventure stories in my head as a kid, basically. I very quickly noticed that uh, one of the limitations of the of of Twine's style of showing the choices visually is that when you have a lot of choices, it can very quickly become um, a maze, uh, a, a forest of nodes and branches that you can very easily get lost in. Twine, especially at the time, uh, did not have like the hooks into Unity and the other things uh, that we were doing that would make um, sense. It was requiring a decent amount of work. Uh, and so um, Yarn sort of came out of that as the kind of solution to, well, if we could take some of the functionality of, of Twine, not all of it, but just some of the stuff that we were specifically using. And because um, there have been other um, sort of um, little things here and there that kind of sort of did that, that kind of thing. But it was like, okay, well, let's make something that like really fits like our specific needs. And by our, I mean kind of mine because I didn't know how to code. Uh, still don't. Sorry, everyone. We had tried all the other tools that were out there at the time. So Twine was very popular or just growing in popularity, I think. And I've done a lot of work with Inform. And I didn't find myself being really fluent and really happy with any of them. So the very first thing we did when we founded the company was design a well what would we what would we like if we could use anything to write in what would what would we want um and the very first version of ink uh was put together for that reason actually just because it, it, we didn't think there was a tool that did what we wanted it to do yarn started because i did not know how to make a video game or how to code <laughs> and that was basically it yeah so I met my co-founder while working at PlayStation, which is not on interactive fiction at all, really. But before I got my job at PlayStation, I was making Parser-based games using Inform. So I was part of the Parser-based community in the 2000s, which is also where Sam Barlow did a lot of work and Emily Shorts uh, did a lot of work um, and a few other, other names that people would recognize kind of from the gaming scene were around at the time. Um, but yeah, we were making text adventure games basically in the Infocom style and kind of pushing the boundaries of that, which was really exciting and interesting and kind of was one of the core things that led to the founding of Inkle because I was showing these games to Joe and saying, look at all these interesting ideas. And Joe was saying, yes, but I can't work out how to play them. And that was, that's kind of the fundamental point of Inkle as a studio, really. The reason why I started working in Bitsy at all is that because I, I just, I've never had like I never learned how to uh make games before and I just kind of encountered the tool and I was like oh this is pretty good like it's simple and uh you know quite restrictive which meant that like the creativity um makes it easier for the creativity to, to flow in a way um for me anyway that's the case and um and just not being overwhelmed by too many things on the screen made it easier as well to like just kind of get into it and get creating so I, I got quite frustrated trying to write fiction for that text adventure structure because it was great at laying the world out, but it wasn't very good at putting interactions into that world in the moment. And what I realized was that in a choice based structure, one has a, a setup where it's very easy to write a conversation with someone. It's extremely easy to write a conversation. You just write it. Um, but it was harder to lay out the world-based structure, but I preferred it that way round because then I could do the conversations and the moments and the interactions and the set pieces that I wanted to do. 
And then it was just a programming problem to get it to fit into the framework of a wider world. I have very strong feelings on tools in general, uh, mostly because I have had these conversations a lot over the course of my career. Um, so what I, what I want to suggest is that a good tool is accessible. Uh, it's, it's easy to onboard for people who haven't used it before, and it's flexible. It does the things that you need it to do for your project. It maybe even does a couple more things that you need to do for either later projects or later in your project, uh, or, or features that you don't necessarily need to touch, but that you're not constantly struggling with the tool to get it to do something that it doesn't do already, essentially, right? You don't necessarily want a tool that you then have to have a tool to integrate into your engine. Um, I have seen workflows like that. They make me cry. Not necessarily Twine. I think a tool like Twine is useful because it gets you, like, if, especially if you want to do narrative design uh, or even game writing, it gets you into the habit of, like, <laughs> learning how to scope well on one side. And it also helps you kind of understand interaction and player stuff and like I mean you get the general idea of like variables and stuff like that if you don't actually know much about them um so I think not necessarily twine but like any of those tools like Inkle or um I've forgotten all the tools now um <laughs> I I need something to look at I need something to hear I need something to like you know a feel while I'm doing the text and uh that usually gravitates me towards like uh fungus or rpg maker uh game maker studio the ideal game writing tool doesn't exist to me um it's like it goes back to you know um like you know get the right hammer for the right job is like okay cool there's a reason we have a ball peen hammer there's a reason we have a claw hammer there's a reason we have a mallet there's a reason we have a sledgehammer and there's a reason we have a jackhammer it's like they're all very good at doing very different things for very uh, for very different uh, energy inputs and outputs. If you've used proprietary tools, I think there's just a general sense of, oh God, here we go again. But if you're used to graphical programming or aren't used to programming in general, I find that visual interfaces can be really, really helpful for getting writers to see what their writing is actually doing and where their writing is most needed. If there's unbalanced paths or there's more content needed over here. So I, I, I personally really like when uh, uh, tools indicate either visually or not where content is lacking or missing or not hooked up. Twine is very good for like player driven choice and um, concealing information that you want uh, people to draw their attention to because like you can just you can hyperlink those words and it's very obvious that you've hyperlinked the words and like, you know, players being curious people as well select it. Uh, something like Fungus where it's uh, note-based uh, inputs, it's very good for disguising uh, a lot of choices. It's very good for disguising um, everything behind like diegetic information, you know, character X asks character Y something and you don't want to know the uh, input or output, depending on how you've written the content. RPG Maker is very good for little handheld micro experiences or um, sort of just like nothing that's really text too text heavy, but uh, can, um, you know, make use of the stage really quickly. If a tool can be integrated into another tool and I can get end to end where I want to be, I'm perfectly happy and I love that. That's the ideal scenario, right? If I can't import it, I often find myself wanting it. And I've seen this happen for a lot of other people, right? So there's a, a tracery is one of my favorite extensions for procedural text. It's really easy to use. Uh, it's, it's grokkable, as Kate Compton might say. And as a result, people have ported tracery to Unity, to Twine, to Inform, uh, to all other sorts of, of engines that, that people can play with it in so that it can have that kind of integration. And so I find it really important that I am able to get a get an output tool into something that I like. So I one of the reasons I, I do still use Twine is that I know I can port it into something like an Electron. I think you have to like make the difference between like writing line of dialogues and writing narrative in that sense. You know, like are you writing a story or are you writing characters? And I feel like that there's like a, a little bit of a of overlap between the two obviously but I think like you have to be quite sure of like what you're trying to, t to tell. There was a lot of acting that we wanted to do, acting and choreography that we wanted to do um, for Nine in the Woods or that I, I was really like pushing for and 
And so, like, when we were talking about it, I was just like, like, would you just use, like, emojis or something? Like, you know, like, little winky faces or smiley faces and just make that trigger a, a smile. But yeah, so it was, like, really important because if you have these characters emoting and, like, acting and running all over the place, you need the ability for people who aren't, um, you know, coders to be able to go in and do that if you have those people being, like, core parts of your team. It's interesting. I feel like um, my impression from doing different games with different tools is that generally a lot of things can work fine, right? Like you could do it in plain text. You could do it with, with screenplay software. You could do it in, in specialty software like Twine. And all of them can kind of work good enough that you can kind of end up, this, end up in this situation where you've got a hammer and you're suddenly surrounded by nails. But when you are doing something with a tool that is appropriate, that is designed for what you're doing, it can be a lot easier too. Like suddenly you're not running up against the limits of the tool. For me, the most important thing about ink is that when you want to write, you can just write. And then having written, you can read what you've written without having to fart about with flowcharts and to hunt down branches. You can see it and assimilate it as an overview very efficiently and then having read it and realized that it's not as good as it could be you can edit it directly without having to break syntaxes or unwire things or disconnect connections and you can move things around and you can insert new choices or remove old ones with keystrokes in a matter of moments without breaking the structure and the flow of your file so what that gives us is the ability to to write read and redraft which i don't think any flowchart based tool can give a writer. What's really interesting is that every single person that I spoke to brought up Twine unprompted. It's a really, really amazing tool and it has a special place in the hearts of narrative designers. Another tool that certainly has uh, opinions about it is spreadsheets. I have a healthy respect for spreadsheets. I mean, a spreadsheet is a database and a database is a way to uh, organize and sequence and search data. So I think they're useful, but it can also be pretty bleak if you are facing a spreadsheet and trying to come up with, you know, we need 20 different ways to say, get over here. Um, it's fun to do, but there are some mornings where you're like, I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to do this, man. <laughs> I don't know if I got it in me. In my experience for me, it is impossible to write good prose within the box of a spreadsheet. It's just inhuman. No one can do it. I, I suspect there are writers who actually can do it. I don't know how they do it. I guess human beings are amazing and can use any tool. And a spreadsheet on your computer, like that looks like work. It's not an intuitive way of writing. No, spreadsheets, they don't have any narrative context and the boxes are too small and you can't see the words and you can't skim read. and editing and redrafting is almost impossible. Pretty much everything that a writer needs to be good at writing, a spreadsheet does not have. So I think I, I, would, I would say that I detest them. Spreadsheets are amazing and terrible. Uh, spreadsheets are abused and used horribly and amazingly in almost every discipline, not just writing and narrative, where spreadsheets are used. I don't think I would be capable of writing anything even vaguely good. Um, in a spreadsheet format, I think it would I think it would kill me and kill my soul very efficiently. Um, so hats off to the people who do. I work generally in Excel. Um, spreadsheets, you know, are a big part of writing a lot of the time. Um, and then that gets yeah, and then that gets imported into an in-engine tool. I think in Unity. I mean, a spreadsheet is a tool from the 1970s for dealing with bank accounts. It's just like it's got nothing to do with you know anyway. Surely there's a reason why that's such a common thing. <laughs> like... I regret to tell you that I am a spreadsheet aficionado. I don't like this about myself, but I am. I don't think there is a single correct way to use a spreadsheet in the same way I don't think there's a single correct way to use like a whiteboard. And I think that's a good thing. I think spreadsheets are kind of a fungible, flexible tool that people use to fill and scratch whatever itch they have at the time. Uh, I don't necessarily think they're a solve-all tool for the narrative game development community despite the fact that they're very common. I just think that the fact they use means there's no tool that has filled that gap yet. The reason I am both pro-spreadsheet and guilty about feeling pro-spreadsheet is I understand where people dislike spreadsheets from. I really, really do. At least I think I do. But they are one of the most useful tools 
as a workflow. They integrate into everything. You can get your spreadsheet to talk to your game in real time. If I want to edit something and I have made a mistake in balance, I can go into the spreadsheet and then fix it and then just push the change and then it's there. I don't have to go into the blueprint node. I don't have to go into um, 18 different text files. Uh, it doesn't matter if a spreadsheet's part of a pipeline to make a narrative game, but it's probably not the end of that pipeline. And I think current, it probably shouldn't be the end of that pipeline, and that currently is for a lot of people, which is probably more telling about the quality of other tools and the flexibility of other tools than it is about you know the fact that spreadsheets are particularly amazing. I actually feel okay with them as a writer. I kind of, uh, I have such a wide range of formats that I've written for at this point that I very much just like adapt to what I'm given. And especially with what I'm working on, it works perfect. Like the format of the spreadsheet works really well for how we write it. The spreadsheet is easy, powerful, and effective. Yes, it is absolutely ugly. Uh, and yes, it is really hard to sort through. Um, those are two of the objections I have heard most often, or at least most passionately. But at the end of the day, they're very effective. And I, I wish we had something better, right? A lot of game writing is about associating dialogue with metadata. I think that spreadsheets offer the promise of being able to do that in a controllable way. I think the reality actually is you'd be better off using a JSON file, if, especially if you had something to make sure you get your quote marks in the right place, because text editing is much easier than, than tablature editing. I guess when you're making a game with a huge amount of metadata associated with every line and a changing amount of metadata in the spreadsheet is a good solution for dealing with the data problem. So this is why I think Excel exists as it does and why it is an industry standard. Excel does everything. And the thing is, a better tool than Excel would need to be as flexible as Excel is. But what I actually want from a tool when I'm looking for a new tool or, or, or something is something that solves a specific problem. You could write a whole game in spreadsheets. It's not designed for it, but you, you can push it to do that. Listen, I am open to having my mind changed, but I think the problem of what replaces Excel is a problem because it's the thing that has become so versatile for what we do and solve so many problems so badly, but solve so many problems. Yeah, well, I just think the problem is that the data problem is not the problem that writers should be having to solve in the first place. Like I get that it's a big part of games, like a big part of my job as a game designer is database management and, and data entry and things. But I like to dissociate that from the writing process because my data brain is pretty boring actually. And my writing brain is hopefully all sparky and exciting and they don't really get along. So if you want something that's better for certain kinds of uh, procedural generation waiting, uh, somebody will design you a tool for that. Uh, if you want something that can keep track of a ton of different branches, Ink is great for that. Um, there are specific tools that solve very specific, very necessary things much better than Excel. The thing that I think Excel it does very, very well is everything. Uh, what it doesn't do is keep track of things uh, for the person on the, the actual person writing. Uh, it keeps track of it very well for the computer, uh, it does not necessarily keep track of it for the person who's writing. Because writers need good tools to do good work, whereas a lot of tools are designed for computers. And computers don't need help. Computers are fine, actually. They're perfectly fine. They're doing great. Lots of people look after computers, but nobody thinks of the writers. So when I am working in Excel on any sort of thing that is long form or not structured in a way of like, this chunk goes here, this chunk goes here, this is all VO that triggers here, VO that triggers here, if I'm doing anything more complicated than that, then I'm using another tool to help visualize where certain things are going. The focus of the game is, I think, should and hopefully does influence the tools you use to create it. Something like Night in the Woods, which is about a place and the characters, you would want a tool that, that foregrounds the writing while something that's a AAA shooter where this story is basically bringing you through the game. It's more of a, a tool to get you to the next scene. Uh, you don't need a tool that that puts the writing so far in the foreground necessarily. Again, I think I think the tools you use will influence the what you create with them. And if you're using a tool that that foregrounds dialogue, um, and you're building a AAA shooter, you're probably going to get a AAA shooter that foregrounds dialogue in it. Which uh, I would I think that sounds like a cool idea. Actually, I'm very I'd be very curious. This is a very expensive experiment, but to take a team, split it into, give them all the tools they need. Except one is using 
you know, software that's normally used to build shooters, and one is using software that's normally build, used to build uh, heartfelt narrative-based story games, and tell them to build the same game and see what comes out the other end. I think you would see that the tool influences the game created, and I would love to play that shooter. <laughs> You know, I, I'd be I'd be keen to try it out and see if I like it. <laughs> I like them. I respect them. I have a healthy respect for them. But uh, if you ask me what I prefer to work in, my favorite software to open is not going to be uh, Excel or OpenOffice Calc or anything. <laughs> Spreadsheets really are quite polarizing. So to take us out, I asked our guests what advice they had regarding writing and tools. Uh, to someone new to the field of games writing and they want to get started in games writing, they should totally make like a, a game with Twine or a game with Ink or a game with Yarn Spinner and see how they go. Uh, I would probably personally start with Twine and then move to either Ink or Yarn Spinner, depending on the type of game I was making. Uh, and then I would go from there. You don't need any art, you don't need any graphics, you don't even need any writing ability. Just keep writing, make a game and see where you end up. Try and find a story that you have to tell. Just because you can't write or don't think you can write doesn't mean you can't tell a story. And uh, all these tools have really great tutorials that will let you get started with minimal fuss. So pick one and start writing. If you want to just write branching fiction, then I would pick up Inky and just start writing in it because you can just get on with it. Um, but if you're really want to see what's going on with branches and things like that, if kind of if you need that stability a lot of people worry when they can't see a flowchart especially when they're starting out then maybe something like twine is better for getting that overview straight away there's also a, a web thing we made called inkle writer which is actually nothing to do with ink um but is pretty good for beginners and that's used by kind of seven to eleven year olds in schools a lot um but to be honest i think if you really want to make something the most important thing to do is to find collaborators who can cover the skills you haven't got. Like, I think a pure writer on their own will always very quickly hit a ceiling, but a writer coupled with a good programmer, I think can do pretty much anything out there. Um, so my first advice would be learn a tool. And my second advice would be make a friend. Find a tool that looks interesting, like so Twine or Ink. Find one that kind of like, look what kind of games are made with it, see what clicks with you, and then just make something. But, big but, plan it before you write it don't just start going get your scope do not do what i did because <laughs> a lot of people make the mistake of like they just start writing and like branching everything and then it gets overwhelming and then you put it away and don't think about it again don't do that <laughs> plan out make something really small and simple the first time so you know what you're doing and then just go wild researching games that you like and, and and thinking okay how would i diagram this in my head also you can probably just look at go down go to emily short's blog go go read all of emily short's blog all nine thousand pages of it um emily short's blog i was talking to a game writer yesterday and we're like yeah that has launched more careers and made more people game writers than anything else i don't know other than possibly choose your own adventure books or text adventures like it's just Emily Short's blog, I learned so much about how to think, about how to structure video game stuff. I think also, when it comes to structure, I think uh, just sitting there diagramming a game that you like and going, where does this branch? How does this work? Oh, this thing you said here ends up coming back later. And I played it again, and if I don't do this thing here, that doesn't come back later. Why is that? Stop mucking about with the setting document and just write something. Um, I find the best way to uh, get a sense of um, what your setting is, what the, uh, what the what your world's doing, your internal logics and everything, uh, write, write about 10 short stories from different perspectives and, uh, and set yourself a um, limit of uh, uh, nobody's lying, but they're not telling the full truth. You'll always, hopefully, ideally, uh, look back at your earlier work and only see the flaws. And initially that can feel bad because you're like, oh, I thought this was good, but now I see that it's garbage. But what it really is, is you're saying, oh, I'm a better writer now. <laughs> I can see flaws that I didn't see before. And that means my current work is, is hopefully better. So keeping at it, doing stuff, sharing it, and recognizing that as you put the work in, you get better. And this is, this is what I love about any form of writing is that you can't do it without getting better at it. It is impossible for someone to spend five years writing 
and not get better at writing just because the work of doing it is is the practice like you you get better at it by doing it Thanks everyone for coming and a huge thank you to all of my guests for spending so much time talking to me and helping me put this thing together. My name is John Manning and you can reach me on Twitter at Displuster. My studio is The Secret Lab. Huge thanks also to Tim and Paris for helping me to write this thing and to Mars for visual design. I really hope that we can all be together again soon and uh, see you next time.